Ninth grade uh, science class, I asked a question to the teacher. Says, "Well, when you strike a mass, why does not the Earth burn up?" Well, the reason why the Earth doesn't burn up is because the bulk of ambient air is composed of non-combustible gases, or gases that do not support the burning process, like nitrogen in your for your rare gases, like argon. Okay. So because of this, the atmosphere doesn't burn up. Now, when we release the hydrogen and oxygen gases through the electrical polarization process uh, under residence. Then we now automatically adjust the burn rate of hydrogen. I'll put it back up here again. Uh, the burn rate of hydrogen from 325 centimeters a second down to the burning levels of 43, 42, 41, and this would be gasoline to gasoline or even to diesel fuel. And automatically, that when you release the hydrogen and oxygen from natural water, you are also releasing the non-combustible gases from water in your uh, adjusting the flame down to around 47 uh, centimeters a second. Now when I was uh, uh, filing the patents uh, in the United States and in the international areas, uh, they didn't know what I was talking about. The prior art was styrometrics. Styrometrics basically was taking the, the hydrogen and go through a, uh, an orifice, and the hydrogen would hit a hot plate, and then the, and then the oxygen would, I mean the hydrogen would intermix with the oxygen, and then that combustion with the energy going in the hot place now could release some of the energy in the hydrogen. The problem with that the prior state-of-the-art technology was that it took a tremendous amount of energy into the hot plate to, in order to, to come up with the gas combustion process. But inherently, when we release the, the gases from water, it adjusts around 47 centimeters a second, and when we light the gas, even to melt steel, it's a self-sustained system. And it blew their minds, and in fact, that we could really do this. And we went on further with it, to give an illustration of it, because when they asked me, you know, the United States is a very highly scientific country, right? So when they approached me and said, we don't know what you're talking about, adjusting the burn rate of hydrogen, I said, if I give you the answer, will you give me my patents? And of course, I gave them the answer and, and consequently received my patent. But give you an example of this, of what I'm talking about, is that if you would have a flash tube, that this would be a flash tube here, and you fill this flash tube up with uh, hydrogen and ambient air gases, and you would spark it at one end, then the burn rate in one second would travel about 325 centimeters in measurement. Now if I would fill the tube up with natural gas in ambient air, we found out that it would burn around 42 centimeters per second. So it became very obvious then that just as we could sustain and maintain the burn rate of the hydrogen and oxygen gas around 47 centimeters a second by using the non-combustible gas as a modulator. Now what I mean by here, here's the oxygen atoms, and now you subject it to a modulating gas, and this is the oxygen atom, as you see right here. And so as a result of this, that the modulated gas, or the non-combustible gas, as you see right here, slows down the speed by which the oxygen atom unites to the uh, hydrogen atoms, and as a result of this, you now slow down the speed by which uh, these two gases will go into combustion. So it's quite obvious that if I we now would subject natural gas or take hydrogen, we now can inject more non-combustible gas in the process and we can take it right down to the burning levels of natural gas or gasoline or diesel fuel. So what do you have to inject with the Right. So now we got a third component to the technology uh, to comply with the law of economics. The only thing I'm using now is natural water, right? Voltage, which I'm not, uh, is a non-consuming source in electronics, right? Now I'm using ambient air. Now if you guys, if anyone can come up with cheaper commodities than that, let me know and I'll go pat him on the back. <laughs> okay, so now that gives us the ability to use an ambient air in the process. Now when you look at an internal combustion engine as an example, then you, as a design engineer, you will look at the internal combustion engine in three ways. And uh, as you see here, now when we feed this in, the gas coming in, uh, Give my little spark plug here. That when the gases go in, number one, the internal combustion engine is a mechanical drive device, is it not? Got us here today? Yep. Okay, secondly, is it not an air pump? Yep. Does it take the pump and sucks it into the carburetor? Yep. Right? And shoves it out uh, the exhaust. Yep. Thirdly, is it not a manufacturer now of non combustible gases? Mm -hmm. Yes, because as the ambient air goes in, and mixes in the gas compression process does two things simultaneously. It consumes the oxygen atom and also consumes any burnable product in the in the air.
So its byproduct is non-combustible gases. So it was very easy now to take the internal combustion engine, take the fuel cell over here, the, the water fuel cell technology, come up in here, meter mix it with the exhaust gases, and as a result of meter mixing, now we can take it and pick it back up, and we now automatically adjust the burn rate of the hydrogen gas, the co-eco, gasoline, and diesel fuel. Now, since I'm using the ambient air up here, how much is it costing me? You know, Zippo, right? So it takes a, and does it comply with the, with the EPA standards? Yes, because non-combustible gases, uh, the air going through the process does not interact with the process, so you're not changing the, uh, the, the status quo. So when you talk about it's impossible to do something, it, it's only to the, the creative imagination uh, of the technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we take this technology, uh, the non-combustible gases, is that we now can take hydrogen, we can take air and expose it to the flame to create non-combustible gases, and now we have a way of taking and transporting hydrogen gas through conventional gas grid systems without ever changing it. Now the prior art says that you have to take hydrogen gas, cool it down about 465 degrees below zero, you got to put it under a lot of pressure and you got to truck it down the road. You spend a lot of energy to, to move the hydrogen down the road. But by simply meter mixing now, non-combustible gases from ambient air, you can now can adjust the burning of hydrogen less than that of your, your standard fossil fuels. And guess what? You don't even have to change even the, even the control knobs on the distribution lines in order to get it transported. So all of this is still now complying to the law of economics. So that was the number one major in invention, was to be able to render hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. And of course, the quenching circuit technology gave us the ability. Now, another area that we developed to comply with the uh, uh, federal and the state safety code regulations is we developed what was also called the quenching circuit technology. And in all probability, if the NASA would have had this technology, our astronauts would not have uh, died in vain. But uh, to give you an example of this, as an example of this uh, form of technology, I'll go like this. It is a requirement on the gas ignition that the hydrogen and the oxygen atom must unite together to bring on spark ignition, right? So we found out that uh, the fuel cell is a multi-gas generator. It's producing and releasing the ambient air in the form of non-combustible gases in the process. So we found out that if we pass it through a very narrow passageway, somewhere along the line, the non-combustible gases are going to separate the hydrogen and oxygen gases and come up with a no, no spark zone. So as a result of this, we now had a 100, developed a 100% fail-safe way of igniting the gas and maintaining it with a 100% anti-spark back device, irregardless of gas volume or pressure. And the simple technique was to use the non-combustible gases to give us the quenching effect inside. Now the materials we use uh, in the quenching disc and supporting the high temperature flame was for like uh, ceramic material, like aluminum. And ceramic materials generally go up to around 3,000 degrees before they start getting real soft and melt down. But uh, we can support flames uh, anywhere from uh, 2,005 to 10 to 20,000 degrees and not melt the ceramic material because the non-combustible gases not only prevent spark back into the system, but it also elevates and controls the speed by which the oxygen atom is now being released into the air under pressure. And as a result of this, the non-combustible gases acts as a cooling agent mm -hmm. between the flame and the ceramic material and it's actually cooled to the touch. Mm -hmm. So that simple thing now gave us the abilities to comply with the federal safety highway safety code regulations. And of course that technology took us to the quenching tube with, by which these small little passageways acts as the quenching element and now you can pass the fuel through these, this quenching tube and as a result you can uh, shoot it with a tracer bullet or uh, burn it with a, a lighter and it will not spark back into the generator. That gave us the ability to retrofit now even to cars. What size are those holes? Uh, right well, there can be 15 to 25 thousandths, okay? And uh, if you want to mix it a little bit more, you're not going to add more non-combustible gases to it. So if you, if you cycle more non-combustible gases with it, the holes can elongate uh, even though, uh, a little greater than that. Okay, so that gave us the abilities to retrofit the fuel cell to existing uh, technology. But as we mentioned a little while back, now we wanted, we have shown that voltage disassociates the water molecule. We show the circuitry, the abilities to restrict the amplitude and allow voltage to take over, but we need to produce a lot of electrical power. 
Now, most of the electrical power plants are being propelled by uh, coal or gas or what have you. We can use the water to, to do this. But there's cases now where we need higher energy yields. And so the EPG system was developed for this purpose. One is I was showing you with the non uh, the magnetized gas inside the closed loop tube, we're using various methods to propel the gas. Now, uh, in this particular case, we were talking about the electric motor driving the uh, non-magnetic turbine wheel, which could be converted to wind power and what have you. If I wanted more power output of this generator, what would I do? Could I put another pickup coil here? Yep. And could I put a, another pickup coil here? So out, power output of the generator is determined by what? The, uh, the coils. amount of coils. Right, it's determined by number one, the strength of the magnetic yeah. field, <laughs> the velocity of that magnetic field, the number of turns per coil, and the number of coils, right? So all of these, do these not comply with the power factor of electrical power generation? The only thing I've done now is I have eliminated the opposing magnetic field problem, which was the greatest problem in electrical power generation. Now I'm a little tired of the, uh, the non-magnetic tube, and so uh, in some cases, I now have put in an electromagnetic pump. And I come over here with an electronic pulser. And uh, I now want to produce an electrical generator that has no mechanical moving parts to it. Now in this analysis, if my, if my eraser was a magnet, and I would put the magnet close to the magnetic gas, would it lock onto the gas? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, so if I move the permanent magnet, would I now now move the gas? Yes. Yeah. So therefore, if I now take this coil and I energize this coil to produce an electromagnetic field, and I deflect this magnetic field in a vertical direction, would I not now move the gas? Yep. Yeah. Where's the bearing? There ain't one. Where's contact brushes? <clears throat> Can I now either hook this up in series or parallel arrangement, come up with any power output I so desire? Yeah. Yep. What about the geometry of that system? Can you not refine that so that you, you were describing this in, this in terms of a square? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, but that's not the geometry of it in real terms. No, no, no. no. John, geometry in real terms, it is now going circular spiral. in spiral configuration. Well, well, in well, were we talking about that last night? Acceleration, right. Acceleration. Yeah. Now, uh, the key to it is, for example, if I had the uh, electromagnetic pump here, and I now had the magnetic tube like this, it becomes, around. It becomes a coil. Alright, now it becomes a coil. Mm -hmm. Now, if, uh, uh, let's take an analysis of this. Let's say that uh, coming into this, uh, this, this had a, a given magnetic field strength. Now, in electronics, if I would take a coil and I wrap this coil many, many turns, the more, the more times I'd wrap it, the stronger the magnetic field would become, right? So if I had 1x magnetic field here, and I coiled this now, and let's say I coiled this 100 times, what's the, what's the magnetic field strength of this? Become exponential. All right, it's, so therefore it's 100 times. All right, so I now start to wrap the coils around this circular pathway, this uh, coil pathway, as you see here. Coil on a coil. Coil on a coil. Now my power output is determined by, again, the strength of the magnetic field, right? The velocity of the field, and what's my next equation? The number of wraps, right, of the coil, and the number of turns per coil. It gives you field strength. It gives me tremendous field strength. Okay, so here I'm using now uh, an electromagnetic pump to produce the electrical energy. Now, when you get to EMF field, there's a reason why this was developed this way, is because uh, the next question is, I want to eliminate as much as possible Lin's laws. Mm -hmm. On opposite, Lin's laws, uh, okay? So the prior state of the art says here I have a coil, and I'm now moving the magnetic field uh, through this coil, and I'm now moving it perpendicular to the coil. So I have tremendous opposition to moving that magnetic field as he was pointing out, right? Well now, can I move a magnetic field inside another magnetic field? Yes. And uh, could I do it in a way that minimizes the amount of opposition? Coherent Absolutely. Coherent. Yeah, because uh, uh, under this analysis, the magnetic fields are moving perpendicular, so you have opposition. But if I moved it through this way, mm -hmm. I have a minimum amount of opposition to the movement of the field, right? Mm -hmm. So when you develop an, e an EMF field of a coil, which way does the, co uh, the EMF develop? At right angles to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it develops away from the coil. Yeah. 
that's an EMF. So you take it with the cord. Yeah, so now you got a situation that... Well, you can't hold all of the electrons. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> am I defining laws of physics? No, you're not. Across not. Yeah, it's okay. So here is the magnetic field of the gas. Yeah. That's the gas, right? And this is the EMF field. <coughs> so therefore, can I not pass this magnetic field through this magnetic field and have minimum amount of opposition? Of course. Right? So when they say they can't undo it, it's the way you should look at the, the technology. So we've developed uh, technology that's produced that effect, but that yes. effect need not necessarily be like that as you prove. Yes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I have eliminated a reduced Lenz law down to minimum, because I'm moving this magnetic field inside another magnetic field, which gives me least amount of opposition. Mm -hmm. Still getting the same pickup on the coils, though. Sure. Absolutely. So uh, the, the axis, um, axis is a zero point. Uh, right. Uh, theoretical. The, cent the, uh, the center of anything mm -hmm. is yeah. negligible force. Right. Yeah. It's a negligible force in the center. Theoretical axis. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, uh, the differential is from zero on out, and so therefore we have the, the ability to move the magnetized gas with a very little opposition to it. Now you link this up with a water fuel cell, and a water fuel cell now is producing the electrical energy. Can I not increase that electrical uh, output still further? All right, now when you move the magnetic field through that alternator, that field moves at a very slow pace, very slow. So now can we increase the speed of the magnetic field? And can we not do it in a way that we can uh, increase power output still further? So we've taken the technology now, even to a very higher state, we have now taken it to a point of solving the problem of over unity devices by simply now injecting laser energy input into the magnetized gas. Now what I want to do is uh, give an analysis here. Now let's say for an example, now this is uh, uh, exit. Alright, now I want to increase power output still further. And I'm now starting to inject laser energy into the magnetized gas. Now the key was, how can we increase the magnetic field of mass, or uh, increase the magnetic field without increasing mass? Now if you're doing that, you can do something. Now we talked about the coil wrapping, but another classic example is, if I had to magnetize gas here, it's a phenomenal effect that if I would inject laser into, into, into the process, this electron would move out to a higher, orb, uh, higher orbit, would it not? Yeah. Yeah. Now in the law of physics, I better stop. In a mechanical drive system like the electromagnetic pump system to drive the magnetized gas, I pointed out in the development of the electromagnetic pump system that will drive the magnetic gas and, and all of its physical parameters are producing the electrical energy very economically. Now, the question now comes, can we produce large amounts of electrical energy uh, by moving the magnetic field even or close to that at the speed of light? Because the magnetic field moving through a rotary electrical generator is relatively very slow. Now, the key to a higher power generations was in the areas that, like on over unity devices, as we have mentioned, is that uh, the prior art limitation was that to increase the permanent magnetic field, you had to increase mass, which meant you had to increase the energy input and to move the mass, so that inherently became a detriment to trying to produce electrical energy. So, can we not now, for example, go ahead and then amplify the electromagnetic field of the mass without increasing the mass? And what we found out was that as you inject the laser energy and the nucleus is absorbed in the magnetized gas uh, nucleus, then this electron now will move out to a higher uh, orbital state. And we know that under the law of physics that when you do this, something's got to happen, right? And one, and yes, and one, one thing that takes place is that this electron, the electromagnetic field now, that holds it in its outer orbit becomes weak. And when this becomes weak, then for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, then this electron starts to spin at a faster velocity. And under the electromagnetic theory of magnetism says that whenever a neg negative charged particle moves through an electric static field, B, its byproduct is electromagnetic energy. You know, there's uh, four forces that affects the, the atoms. There's, Electrical force, electromagnetic, weak and strong nuclear forces. It's the electrical force that really is applied to difference of potentials. 
that applies directly to the atomic structure of the atom, and then all the other ones are just built on top of that. So in reference to in increasing the magnetic field strength, it was quite obvious that all we had to do was inject and allow laser energy to be absorbed by the atoms of the gas to now cause the electron to spin at a faster rate as it's now moving away from the nucleus. This gave us the ability to increase the magnetic field without increasing the mass. And that was the answer to over unity devices. Now, we're producing now, as we eject the laser energy into the EPG system, I've now converted the non-magnetic tube into a light guide. Light guide. Now, what that means is, is that I've now if, uh, put in a reflective surface inside the non-magnetic tube. So now when I inject laser energy, a bolt of laser energy into this system, and let's say, for example, this is a 10 watt laser, I'm now producing this magnetic field strength, A. Now, as I do this, then this laser energy, would it not now start moving through this corridor, uh, reflective corridor, uh, close to around the speed of light? <clears throat> so as a result of this, now this laser energy is starting to move this field, this pulse field, and it starts moving and bouncing back and forth and closes this loop system and produces it at an extremely fast rate close to the speed of light. So if I want to increase more power output, in one example, uh, as we pointed out in the prior art, I could add more coils to it, right? Mm -hmm. But now I want to increase tremendous amount of power. Uh, let's say, for example, that I would take this non-magnetic tube, and I would take it from here to Auckland. How far away is that? 20 miles. 20 miles. And then I take the tube and loop it back here. And I wrap 1,000 turns per coil around this non-magnetic light guide. And I hook these coils in series parallel arrangement all the way to Auckland and back here. And I fill it up with a magnetized gas. And then at the one end, I set a laser to it. Now, if I take a laser and I strike the laser, how fast would the light energy go through the tube to back to here? Speed of light. And then faster you can blink, blink your eyes, right? Less than a nanosecond, right? All right, so now, if I take a 10 watt laser and I laser and I pr uh, produce this magnetic field strength, it would now move close to the speed of light to come back to here. Now, when I get back to this point right here, I now laser it again, and I strike the laser again, and now I have an intensity of the field equivalent to B size. And it now compounds itself and bounces around and gets back here again, I laser it the third time, and I produce a magnetic field three times in its intensity. Now imagine taking that, electro, that laser, and I strike the laser a thousand times, or let's say a thousand times in a 10 watt laser, what would this magnetic field strength be equivalent to? A thousand times. Yeah, so it would be a thousand times greater than, uh, or yeah, a thousand times from the 10 watt laser. Okay, so I have what, a 10,000 or 100,000 watt laser equivalent of moving this gigantic magnetic field. So I'm now moving this magnetic field close to the speed of light. Now, the EMF field of the coil is only generated after the magnetic field goes through the coil of wire, right? So as that bolt of laser energy is going through the gas, then there's very little resistance of, of this being moved through the coil because as it's going down that coil, it sees an open corridor with very little resistance. Is that not so? So the EMF is only built afterwards. So if I would pulse this now and set this field and pulse it, and hit it at this intensity, how much electrical energy do you think it can generate? More than you need one. Yeah. I can generate all electrical energy for all the major cities. So in other words, you've done the New Zealand. Are you, are you song bar, you grew up in the EMF bar. Yeah, sir. Sure. Are you yeah. saying that the laser will carry the gas around with it? No, no, no. The gas remains stationary, and the laser action, in other words, the, oh, the atoms and contracts. The, right. Yeah. And so, yeah. isn't that nice? You streamline the thing just like a hypersonic aircraft. It's right. It's leaving the shock waves behind it. Right. right. You've got ahead of the shock waves. Right. No yeah. Absolutely no resistance. Isn't that amazing? I found him in Now you link this okay. electrical power generator with the water fuel cell technology. What what can you not do? The technology <laughs> is only limited to the imagination for you to put it to work. That 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 is that that on its own, just as is, is just ph phenomenal. Yes. But you can't run the entire autonomy off of, off of this no. power. Because as I pointed out earlier, an electric motor cannot handle the, the workload of an internal combustion engine. And, uh, and under the law of economics, we don't have time, for example, to change to electrical drive systems for cars. Uh, Detroit, for example, is not going to change their production line. When Stan Meyer shows them how to take a $2.50 recycling tube 
use the exhaust gases to adjust the burner to hydrogen gas to co-equal that of the fossil fuels and run it off of water. So the law of economic dictates that this direction will go. But the evolution of its development will continue this because, as I was mentioning to several others during our break, that uh, the main centralized power systems uh, have turned out to be the wrong approach in order to provide power, like in the United States. Because in the interim period of time, from the time the first power plant was developed, a lot of the copper wires or the electrical transmission lines are starting to crystallize. So we're starting to have breakdowns, uh, the brown effect occurring, or the electrical wires are now breaking down because of the high exposure of voltage, and they're crystallizing, and we don't have the copper to go ahead and replace those uh, transmission lines. Nor do we have the monies to be able to re-string uh, uh, the transmission lines. So one of the main philosophies now uh, in the United States is to come up with a home power generation system. So we link this to the water fuel cell, and we're going to be releasing uh, this unit, which will be the equivalent to a half size of a hot, a hot water tank, about 18 inches in diameter, and its average power draw will be 220, 300 amp draw capacity. And link this up to the water fuel cell, then we have an unlimited power source, very economic. And the only thing I'm using here is a tube, a bunch of wires, uh, and the gas. Now, I would not point out how to make the magnetized gas uh, for an extremely long period of time because when a scientist comes into my laboratory and says, if you can show me how to stabilize the magnetized gas at room temperature, you're doing something. And he's right because um, this will set on an evolution like you will not believe. Now, in chemistry and linking up with atoms, we're always under a natural state in order to link up the, the atoms to covalent link up. Now there are a lot of uh, ways of doing it. Now there's three atoms that exist in nature that exhibits electromagnetic fields. There are iron ions, and there are nickel ions, and there are cobalt ions. And the key to the link up was to come up with a gas lattice that would stabilize at room temperature and amplify the electromagnetic field. So one of the techniques, this is not the only technique, but this is the technique that uh, that I'll relate. But there will be an evolution now in chemistry where hundreds of millions of new uh, chemical compounds will come about as a result of this. <clears throat> Under the prior state of the art, there are such atoms now in this particular case to make a magnetic la a gas lattice. We're going to use an iron and uh, iron ions and uh, uh, argon as an example. Iron, cobalt, and nickel are atoms. Now, most they look at it as a metal substance, but really they're composed of the same atomic structure. They only have different number of protons and different number of electrons, right? All right, so if you get them down into the atomic structure, then they, they operate and function just like any other atoms do. And now, uh, the reason why uh, iron, and uh, reason why iron as an example, or cobalt or nickel, exhibits electromagnetic fields is because all of their electrons uh, rotate in the same direction. The reason why uh, the wood and so forth does not exhibit an electromagnetic field is because their electrons pair together and they rotate in opposite directions. Okay? And there are, has been examples of taking um, uh, atoms and exposing them on a plasma on a real high temperatures and high pressures and they would start to exhibit an electromagnetic field. But tremendous energy must go in uh, into that type of system to try to generate the magnetic field. But the key is how do you stabilize it? Well, as we pointed out earlier, that when I took the uh, uh, combustible gas atoms, which we call the hydrogen gas gun, and we exposed that atom to a high voltage field, we got the ionization effect to occur, right? Now, in this particular case, I'm using iron and argon atoms to link up. Now, traditionally, argon is an atom that doesn't link up to anything. It's chemically inert. Why is it chemically inert? And the reason why it's chemically inert is because its second electron orbit is composed, it's composed, composed of eight electrons. Complete right, and as it has its eight complete electrons, it doesn't want to covalently link up to anything. Well now, uh, the question is, is, how do you look at it to uh, accomplish the problem? Well, if that has eight electrons, why can I not now expose the argon atom to high voltage and pluck off its electron. Can I not do that? Mm -hmm. huh? Can I now inject laser energy into the process that aids the process of now aiding to knock off the electrons? 
In other words, if I had an atomic structure this way, then the electrons would go from that orbit to K, L, M, and N orbits, and then eventually be ejected off by the, by the voltage. Can I not do that? Yeah. What proves that out? How about an argon laser? Yeah. It just does it. All right, so therefore, the point and the, the hydrogen gas gun technology, by the way, the hydrogen gas gun technology can be reduced down to the size of a spark plug or the fuel injection port of a F-18 or F-16. So you can miniaturize this thing down tremendously. Now, in this uh, technology, as a matter of fact, when you send laser energy into this process, not only could we generate the electrolytes for all the cities in, in uh, New Zealand, but I can reduce it down to the size of an IC chip and replace the battery in electronics. Isn't that phenomenal? Okay, now, get back on this a minute. If I want to be able to covalently link up with atoms that uh, normally do not link up, then can I not just simply pluck the outer electrons of that atom and now use it as a covalent link up? So if I pluck four electrons from here, from the argon atom, would it not now link up with the, uh, with the iron ions that also have missing electrons? Which was not possible before. Yes, and the reason why it wasn't possible before was the invention of the BIC circuit. The BIC unit restrict amp flow, right? Now like a neon tube. You take a high voltage of neon tube, it produced the light, it plucked off the electrons, right? And then when it was plucking off the electrons, it allowed electrons to go back in the process to stabilize it, to go ahead and pulse again in 60 cycles to release more energy, right? All right, and the VIC unit though, when you pluck the electrons, you're not allowing electrons to go back into the process. Now, so therefore, if I would now expose these two opposite gases, and I now set an inject laser energy in the process, and plucking off their electrons, if I pluck off their electrons, would they not covalent link up? They Absolutely, they would have to link up. So now I have a gas lattice now, where it now can exhibit the electromagnetic field. So if I were to put the gas lattice now inside, so you're saying the gas lattice is argon and ion? No, argon and iron ions, or nickel or cobalt, or any combination thereof. Okay, this is only one example. Where do you get the iron ions from? Well, if you if you have iron, can you not uh, decompose uh, an iron block into iron ions, and then made up of uh, of atomic uh, uh, atomic structure of atoms? Once you knock the electrons off, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Right. The key was artificial uh, knocking it off. As a result of this, uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of new chemical compounds will come about. Uh, the prior art in chemistry is, if you had atom A here, and say, well, I need atom B down here, they may have had to put a whole string of other atoms to come down here to, to, to atom X, right? And the reason why they did that was because of covalent link-up of the atoms, right? All right, why can I not bypass the step and knock off, knock off the electrons here, and knock off the electrons here, and control it to such an extent that they have a match? So you can get like quarter tones on the atomic structure instead of having the harmonic Pythagorean structure. You can vary that among in great further shades. Right, absolutely. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. So, so might you find any laws of physics? It's like artificially produced um, isotopes. Right. Or artificially simply in lit. Well, isotopes, if you want to talk about isotopes, you, you're talking about putting more, uh, two or three electrons into the, into the orbit and everything. What we're doing is plucking the electrons out. Yeah. All right, we're plucking it out. I'm injecting laser energy into the process to simply aid the process. In other words, here's the atom, and I'm now injecting laser energy. What, right? sort, of, what sort of laser energy? Is it helium, uh, neon, or argon? Or doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Anything. I mean, uh, well, I mean, uh, on certain atoms, it will take a different frequency of laser energy, but uh, you simply tune in on the laser uh, laser frequency of absorption, hmm. and so it does it. So basically, uh, a photon light source uh, works very well on it. If here are your energy orbits, and again. You're bouncing them in K, L, M, and N. So if you subject this, you're knocking off the electrons. You're subjecting to a tremendous high pulse voltage. I'm now plucking the electrons. I still have the laser energy here to keep it from going back to stable state. If I intermix those chemicals in the hydrogen fraction technology, they will covalently link up. What sort of voltage do you need? Is it 10,000, 50,000? Doesn't matter. Uh, very little. Uh, how much? See, no, no, the, the, uh, the, the high voltage um, plucking device. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, it can go from uh, 2,000 volts to 10,000 volts, or take it to 20,000 volts up to 90,000 volts. It depends on what type of application that you want. 
the key was that we could produce uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of cubic feet of magnetized gas in the, uh, in the garage yeah. by using the hydrogen fracturing technology yeah. uh, or hydrogen gun technology to give us this ability. So now we're linking, unlike atoms that heretofore uh, you could not link up naturally. We're artificially linking them up by plucking out their electrons. So when you expose the gas to an external magnetic field, then what happens is the magnetic field of this iron uh, ion now starts to link up and you produce an electromagnetic flux line, like so. Which is a composite of the whole lot. Yes, right, all the way around the tube, all the way around the non-magnetic tube. Now the reason why I'm using argon in this case is that there's some characteristics to argon. The characteristics being is that argon is like a lubricator. Uh, second thing is that it's an anti-static device that doesn't like to transmit electrical energy in it. And it also has the ability that it's a magnetic shunt. It doesn't like to be magnetized. And as a result of that, then when you expose it, you're now creating this electromagnetic field. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So not only are you not, you're linking up uh, the, the gas lattice by covalent link up, I'm also now linking it up by electromagnetic link up from one uh, atom structure to another to produce the magnetic flux line. So it's quite obvious now that if I would now take this and I would expose it to the electromagnetic field moving through the pickup coil, would I not generate electrical energy? By the way, Stan, you'll be making superconductors totally obsolete, won't you? Yes. Totally obsolete. Yes. Uh, yes. The superconductor is basically on trying to transmit electrical power without, you know, least resistance on it. Okay, so that's the basic principle of why the EPG system works. Any questions? I'm yeah. still confused about the iron ions. How you how you manufacture them? Well, uh, if you go back in the many years ago, 20, 30, 34 years ago, or in the 40s, uh, 30s, and the 40s, they were uh, using ion generators to generate ions from uh, many different metals. Even including iron and cobalt and nickel. So, um, oh, you mean like a, an iron generator, a negative ion generator? Sure. And you uh, you take your metals and you decompose it into the atomic structure. There's a lot of ways of doing it, but uh, there's too many hours to describe the apparatus. What, but what, what makes it a, a magnetic gas? Why would it be magnetic? Not magnetic? Well, because I'm using atoms that all of their electrons spin in the same direction. So if you have an atom that all of its electrons spins in the same direction, it will exhibit an electromagnetic field equivalent to the number of electrons that are spinning under the electromagnetic theory of magnetism that whenever an electric charged particle passes through an electric static field, its byproduct is electromagnetic energy. But iron by itself See? is not thermally magnetized, is it? Steel is, but iron wouldn't be. Yeah. So why, why is iron not steel? Well, then I'll go around. And why would that not be a, a, uh, the same thing as the normal iron? Well, say that again now. Well, iron, soft iron, is not right. magnetic in itself, is it? Not yeah. permanently magnetized. True. But it still is. Yeah. So why why is, is that? You got iron there. Why is it not? Um, why would well, the reason why that would well, I'm, as I said, now I'm giving you an example. And I said any combination thereof. You can take any any combination of structures to do it. Now, when you talk about uh, creating the electromagnetic fields and you're coming up with uh, the combinations, you can take the combinations and mix it and expose it in the same process. Uh, the reason for that strictly is why it's uh, holding the magnetic field. It's because it's allowing the electromagnetic spin to uh, to not pair together. All right. So in this particular case, uh, the argon atoms are all are all pairing together and they're spinning in opposite directions but it will stabilize to allow this, these electrons to spin in the same direction. But you can take any combination of any of the, of the ion structures and put them together to, to create and enhance the electromagnetic so you, you field. Could, you could use neodymium ion boron, for example, sure. which is a very, very strong magnet right. material. Right, exactly the same thing. And that would set permanent. Right. You remain as permanent, you get permanent. Uh, right, right. You can use all the state of the art mm -hmm. of what they're using today to enhance the, uh, and stabilize that magnetic field. The, uh, the real point being is that once you do this, you're not going to inject the laser energy into the amplify that electromagnetic field. So you're not restricted to just one. I'm giving this as an example of the approach. If I went to a more complicated, it may be a little bit more uh, harder to understand. Okay, so that's the basis of the EPG system uh, technology. Now we also have some advanced technology which we're not bringing out at the present time, and that's also in the atomic reduction process. So this technology has led us to, the alter, to alter the state of the atoms, that we can do, reduce the uh, 
the structure of the atom downward and then covalently link it up with unlike atoms again. So it's opening the doors in areas of... Uh, you can do anything literally with matter now. Yeah. You, you can so basically, transmutation is a, is a bit of complex. Well, mm. well, it's well, yeah, again, it's only subject to limitation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to actually put it to work. So the real key is, is to communicate what's, what we have done and why we're doing it. Because we're going to be faced with a very critical worldwide problem, I feel. Uh, if the Mideast, uh, as I pointed out earlier, erupts into war, uh, then there's a possibility that that oil is going to be contaminated. If it's contaminated, we better start moving on a cord. Otherwise, the economies of not only uh, New Zealand and uh, other countries are going to be destroyed very quickly. But we have a way of doing it, and the way it is, and the way that we must accomplish it, is to sit down there and decentralize the production of the system and decentralize it in installation and set it up as an independent business entities, and that's the vehicle which the Lord has shown me to do it very successfully in the United States, and we are doing this at the present time. Well, we're ready to do that's it. That's it. <laughs> is anybody else who would like to take the floor and add anything or ask any questions or anything? Oh, here, obviously. Here. Anybody at all close open for any questions? Yeah. Well, what's your purpose for coming here? Well, the Lord pulled me away from the project and said to go to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, he knows where. And, uh, <laughs> you started with And uh, so I started asking some questions. And I'm finding out that New Zealand's importing about 50% of their oil into this country. So uh, you're much like we are. We are importing 60% of oil to maintain our economy. If that oil is cut off, tomorrow you die. And we die. So um, the area is to communicate. I've been going to many countries all over the world, communicating and talking about the technology, and to say, hey, there's an answer. Because uh, what we're talking about today, if it complies with the law of economics, and it complies with Kismet, to keep it simple, stupid, and it gives us a, a, an answer to the energy problem, then put this technology in the wrong hands, like the Mafia, or to the Arabs, or any other hostile foreign country then those countries that would be blocked with this technology would be destroyed economically very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And those countries that would have access to this technology could be prospered very quickly. So it's paramount that, unfortunately, there are those who seek to destroy, mm -hmm. and very few seek to build and to maintain. So I have imparted now all of this knowledge and wisdom, and now you have a great responsibility. As I had a responsibility in developing the technology under the power authority word of God and bringing it to this state, now I'm communicating to the youth. Now I can, uh, we can invent and develop this technology, show you that in fact we have an answer to the energy problem, but in the final equation, it's going to be coming down to you guys whether or not it's going to get in. So I don't know the laws in New Zealand. I don't know the people in New Zealand. Uh, I don't know their philosophy. I don't know the, the enemies against New Zealand. But I do know that uh, as the time goes, you're going to have to need this answer, just like the, the other countries. And we've got to be able to somehow move in one accord to bring it about. And if we don't do it, don't rely on the government to do it, of any nation. Absolutely. And don't rely on any international corporations to do it, because they're not going to do it. Uh, it's going to come down to you and I and the guy down the street that says, hey, we're going to pick up the challenge and pick up the ball and go. And if we don't do it, well then... <laughs> then the work has been in vain. Saying, go ahead and do it? Yeah. I mean, you've got papers on it. Are you um, looking for... Yeah, well, well, what I'm starting to do now is to start the vehicle capable of doing it. Now, I don't, if I can develop the technology or the, the equipment, 